Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. July 8, 1994, Lieutenant Colonel James Donald Halsell, Jr., United States Air Force, took a trip that we will never take, making some 236 orbits of the Earth, traveling 6.1 million miles, his job, pilot of the space shuttle Columbia. Pretty impressive, huh? Wait till you hear where he hails from and his folks live today born in 1956 in Monroe, Louisiana. Colonel, welcome to Louisiana Thank Legends. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Colonel, before asking the very serious questions, my wife will leave me if I don't ask <laughs> this question. What do you think about flying saucers? Well, I get asked that question all the time about UFOs and about aliens and flying saucers. And I can tell you that for the 15 days that I was in space, uh, we saw no UFOs, no flying saucers. Uh, as far as my own personal feeling about the topic, I don't know if this planet has ever been visited by other beings, but I do believe that probably there is life somewhere else in the universe. I mean, we're such a small speck of dust compared to the, the immensity of the universe that I think it might be a little bit narrow-minded for us to believe that we're the only place in the universe that life has originated. So I think there's probably something or somebody out there somewhere. Colonel, how does a, a kid from Monroe, Louisiana, end up an astronaut? Well, it, uh, it's kind of a hard question to answer, but I think that probably part of it had to do with the bringing up that I had. My parents were tremendously interested in me and involved with me as I was growing up. My dad took lessons as a private pilot, and I would occasionally get to fly with him in small airplanes. And as a kid of seven or eight years old, I just that was the greatest thing in the world for me. I just got so excited, and that caused me to get interested in aviation. And I think from there, from that little seed, that little germ, uh, from there, I was able to really get interested in the space program and in doing well in school so that I could go on to the Air Force Academy and, and uh, get involved in the space program. So I, I think my dad had a lot to do with it. Uh, I might tell you that uh, Colonel Halsell was not just another pilot uh, uh, flying an airplane. Uh, he uh, graduated first in test pilot school class and was awarded their major trophy for flying an academic performance. So one can see why the space program topped, uh, tapped uh, 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 this uh, Louisiana native. So how do you get ready for a mission? You're an astronaut now. Well, once you're selected for the program, you begin uh, years of intensive study. I was selected to be an astronaut in 1990. My first flight just happened a few months ago in 1994. So you can see that it took me four years to really prepare for it. Uh, we have academic uh, studying classroom uh, situations just like any student in any school would be familiar with. We also spend a lot of time in the simulators, which are not unlike simulators that airline pilots learn their missions in, only we spend thousands of hours learning the different parts of the flight. You have to learn about the ascent, uh, getting up into orbit, and then the on-orbit time, what you're going to be doing every minute of every day that you're up there, then of course the entry and the landing. And all of these are di very different, but very different uh, and critical phases of flight. So uh, we spend a lot of time in the simulator, a lot of time traveling around the country to different places where we can talk directly to the experts involved in our flight. Colonel, how much control, are you a pilot, how much control does a pilot actually have of that aircraft as it hurdles around the earth? Well, um, if you have to, you can grab the control stick and fly it just like any other airplane. Now, for most of the time that the shuttle is taking off and in orbit, we actually let, let the autopilot, the computer, fly the space shuttle. But we're sitting there with our hands crossed, 
and we're watching the computer, the autopilot fly, and if we don't like anything that's going on, we'll take over manual control. Now, it's standard procedure that on entry, coming back down to the Earth to land, uh, the pilot takes over at about 50,000 feet at a speed of about uh, 350 miles per hour. And from there, you manually fly the airplane down to a landing. So the last five minutes of the flight is under manual control. What was the roughest part of your training? What, what do you recall with, oh my goodness, some things you wake up and think about? Well, um, I think at about one month prior to launch, my list of to-do things got as long as it was ever going to get. And, and up until that point in time, no matter how hard I worked, how late I stayed up at night, how much extra time I put into it, my to-do list, things that I needed to understand or things I needed to learn and get accomplished prior to the flight, kept getting longer and longer. But right at that point, about one month prior to the flight, uh, the, we turned the corner and the list started getting shorter and shorter so that by launch time, we were all ready to fly. So at about one month prior to launch, I felt the crunch. I felt like, uh, man, will I ever catch up? Will I ever be ready to go? But we were ready to go one month later. When, the, when, does the nerve, when do the nerves uh, start? That? When do they click in? The, um, for me, I know it, it, it might sound contrite, but really, you've been training for so long for this particular flight. Uh, everything that you see in the space shuttle when you sit in the actual vehicle getting ready to launch, you've experienced a hundred times before because we have simulators that look and act exactly the same back in Houston. Uh, there is that little bit of difference, however, because I'm a human being and I know that this is for real. This is not training. And uh, I believe that uh, at five minutes prior to launch, which was the last point in the countdown when we could conveniently hold the count, when I heard that we were not going to hold it five minutes but continue the countdown, I knew from my training that, hey, well, this is, we're really going to give this a try. It is now really going to happen. And uh, I'm sure that if they had had a heartbeat monitor wired up to me at that point in time, uh, they would have seen a little spike in the number of beats per minute at that point in time. Can a man uh, or woman help but think about that horrifying accident that did take place with the space program? No, it's something that uh, you have to think about and you have to come to terms with, and that was a horrifying accident. Uh, the Challenger incident caused all of NASA to really stand down, look at itself internally, and try to understand what went wrong. And there were a number of issues that came about, uh, a number of improvements, not only in the engineering and the technical design of the space shuttle, but in the management philosophy that we follow. And I think that as a result of all those improvements, we have a much safer space shuttle and space shuttle program than we did back then. So you think about it, and the real basic question is, are the risks to be confronted worth the benefits to be gained? And from my point of view, the answer is uh, unanimous, yes. Not only personally, because this is something that I was interested in doing, but I think for the country, it's important that we continue to go into space. Colonel, I'm going to ask you a, what will sound like a very simplistic question. What, what does the space program mean to the average citizen? What, what benefits can accrue to me here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? Oh, well, the reason, one of the reasons I'm here today is to participate in a, the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the Johnson Space Center, specifically my boss, Dr. Carolyn Huntoon, who, by the way, is another lady, native of Louisiana from Leesville. Uh, she signed a memorandum of understanding with uh, the Secretary of Economic Development here of Louisiana. And what they've agreed to is to communicate and interact more effectively to... Uh, to bring the benefits of the space program directly to Louisiana. Every year, NASA publishes a book about this thick, several hundred pages long, each page devoted to a different kind of way that technology that NASA has developed for the space program originally has been brought into everyday lives. Medical, agriculture, uh, manufacturing processes, the list goes on forever and ever. I dare say that there's nobody watching this broadcast whose lives have not been directly touched by the space program in that way. I must tell you that that's been a failure of the space program not to get that message out because I read and I, I watch television and uh, we seldom hear of the, the, the physical benefits of these billions of dollars, though we know they're there. Yeah, well just talk to somebody who has had their life saved by one of the newest medical technologies. Uh, that was probably brought about because of NASA's technology being spun off to the medical world. That person is very grateful to NASA. And once again, NASA and the technology that we're able to develop just touches thousands of people every day. And you're right, maybe we don't do as good a job as we should of getting that word across. But as I visit different school groups around this country, I'm very uh, cheered by knowing that the young adults in this country are very much aware good. that our country 
our future, their future, depends on us not sitting on our behinds, but pushing forward on, with technological issues, technological capabilities. And they, uh, they think that the space program has a very important part of that, and they want to be a part of it also. Colonel, uh, so it's the night before your flight. Do you sleep? Um, not a whole lot. Uh, I made a couple of phone calls, one to my girlfriend, one to my parents. Uh, there, were, there was a reunion of my school alumni group that I wanted to communicate with. And I have to do all this by telephone because we're in quarantine at that point in time uh, to try to minimize the risk of us catching a cold at the last minute, for example. Uh, they keep us to ourselves, just us and a few immediate uh, NASA personnel and family members that we can actually get close to. So I spent a lot of time on the telephone that last evening. I did try to go to sleep, and I did go to sleep uh, fairly early that evening, as a matter of fact. But then I woke up in the middle of the night, and I have to admit that I didn't go back to sleep. I just kind of laid there and thought about what was about to happen. That's such an eerie picture when you see the uh, astronaut approach the ship, the launch pad, and the steam coming out. Yes. That it's like watching science fiction. It is, and being a part of it, you feel exactly the same way, even more so. Uh, as you're driving up in the van, they drive you up the launch pad. Uh, the pad has been completely cleared of anybody that doesn't absolutely have to be there because it is, it could be a dangerous situation if we were to develop a fuel leak. So you're almost completely alone. It's just you and the crew and a couple of people who will help you strap into the vehicle. As you drive up, the smo smoke belching out of the engines. As you get closer, you can hear the sounds of all the uh, uh, liquid propellants being piped through the different parts of the vehicle. It's almost like it's alive and hissing at you. Uh, you go up the elevator, which goes very quickly up to the 195-foot level, and you can see the different parts of the vehicle Pro go by. Probably goes quickly so you won't change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to change my mind, uh, but, uh, and I did enjoy the ride up. And then once you get up to the, the level of the gantry, you actually walk across the access arm, so you get a panoramic view of the space shuttle that you're about to ride in before you actually climb inside. All right, sir, so you're in your seat, and you're strapped in. Now, watching uh, uh, on television, that's a very frightening thing, the fire and flames belching out of that giant machine. Okay, so the countdown. How do you feel when that thing is counting down? Well, once you get strapped into your seat and you open up your checklist, you immediately fall into your pilot mode. You're so busy. Uh, my job at that point in time is to do the steps on the checklist, th uh, to throw the switches that I'm uh, responsible for at the exact right time. And I'm concentrating so hard on doing my job as well as I perfectly can that I, I try. You don't really have time, nor do you want to spend time um, thinking about all the emotional issues. And I talked about how my heartbeat beat might have increased a little bit at the T-minus five-minute point. But just shortly thereafter, I knew what I needed to do and exactly when I needed to do it. And I really tried to concentrate hard on those jobs. It's, it's like a prize fighter who, after he gets hit the first time in the ring, the nervousness Exactly vanishes. right. Exactly right. And you fall into doing what you've been trying to do for the last several years. Now, what is the sensation as you take up with all that horrifying force behind you? D does your face, like in a science fiction film, are you contorted? Uh, 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 it, it's, it's, not that, it's not that severe. It's really not. But at uh, T minus six seconds and counting, the three space shuttle main engines at the base of the rocket light up. Uh, we start them up six seconds prior so that they can come up to full power. The computers can check them out to make sure that they're all running properly. And then at T0, liftoff time, uh, the, the two huge solid rocket boosters along the side ignite. And when that happens, there is absolutely no doubt that you're going somewhere. The shaking and the vibration and the noise is quite tremendous. Is that frightening or are you expect it? No, you expect it because once again, the simulators in Houston uh, we have simulators that have hydraulic uh, jacks that shake you must with be the same intensity. Simulator. It really is. And, but it's because of that kind of training that I felt like the whole time that I've been here, done this before, and I knew exactly what I was supposed to be doing. Colonel, do you have to be in any kind of physical condition to undertake uh, uh, something like this? Well, I think it is important to be physically fit. Uh, we don't have a formal physical training program in the astronaut office. It's up to each individual to do whatever he or she thinks is appropriate to keep themselves in shape. Uh, I try to go to the gym every other day, uh, do some aerobic workout, and also do some light uh, weight lifting. Uh, I'm not trying to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. I could never do that, but just to try to keep physically fit enough to do my job. Uh, Colonel, okay, so you're going up. Uh, when those uh, rockets, is it drop away? Right. Is that what we see, drop away? It, what is that sensation? Well, um, at two minutes after liftoff, those solid rocket boosters have expended their fuel, 
Uh, and of course, we want to drop them off because we no longer want that weight to hold us back from getting on up into orbit. Uh, so there are small, several clusters of small separation motors that actually fire across your windscreen. So you get this big flash of red and orange flame as those separation motors push the solid rocket boosters off and safely to the side so that they don't accidentally hit the vehicle as they fall away. And you hear this metallic clang as the pyrotechnics fire and the uh, latches uh, let loose so that the boosters can move away. So you, you know the, that that has happened. That's something that's very evident to you. And then is there a sensation upon entry into orbit? Is there a difference while you're in space? Well, yeah, as you continue on up into orbit, uh, it takes us eight and a half minutes to finally get up to the altitude and the speed at which we need to be at uh, to achieve orbit. The whole time you're burning off fuel, which means the weight of the vehicle is becoming less, which means that the thrust is able to push you faster and faster and faster up into orbit. So this is the point in time where you start to feel the G-forces pushing on your chest, Does a little bit on your face. It doesn't hurt. It's not unlike having, a, I'd say, a teenager sit on your chest. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's about the same as having a small person sit on your chest. And you're kind of pinned in your seat. You can move your arms with some effort, but you want to be very careful that under the G-forces, reaching for one switch, you don't reach for the wrong switch as a result. So you move very slowly if you have to move at all. And, uh, and then at main engine cutoff, when you achieve orbit, eight and a half minutes after liftoff, the engines cut off almost instantaneously. So you go from having this person sitting on your chest to being weightless. So you're kind of thrown forward in the straps. Any pencils or checklists or any other items that are not tied down immediately start floating around you. And you have absolutely no doubt that, yes, we are now in orbit and we are weightless. What is weightlessness like? Well, uh, it's a great thrill, actually. It's a great environment to be able to work in. Uh, to move from one side of the cockpit to the other, you just have to push off with your little finger. And in fact, you don't want to push off any more than that because you just turn yourself into a human cannonball that's going to run into something on the other side. So you learn to move slowly. Uh, I will say that the first few hours, it takes your body a little while to get used to it. Most people feel a little bit of queasiness in yes. their stomach. I think most people have felt when you take the elevator down, the uh, stomach comes up a little bit. You feel that kind of little stomach awareness for a few hours, but that will go away. Uh, you might feel a little bit of dizziness for the first few hours as your brain learns how to perceive the signals from your inner ear without gravity being a factor. But all that uncomfortable feeling goes away within a matter of hour hours. And from there on, you are very much like a newborn baby learning its new environment for the first time. And everything you do, from eating, sleeping, and, and yes, going to the bathroom, any other activity that you can imagine, uh, it, you get to learn how to do it all over again in a new environment. And it's just a lot of fun. Uh, uh, it's unbelievable. The rest of us will, of course, never experience having to learn a new environment at this stage of our lives. Well, more and more people are going to get the opportunity to go in space. Uh, NASA right now, we're working very hard to build the International Space Station. We're working with the Japanese, the Europeans, and the Russians. And over the next several years, we're going to build a space station, which will be, uh, we will have people continually working in this space station, just not for two weeks on orbit, but continually, uh, probably go up there for three months at a time, and then uh, a space shuttle will bring another crew How up, and you'll like come home. Would you like that kind of duty on a space station? I think it would be fun to do, and I think that it would be rewarding to have the opportunity to do your scientific experiments or your manufacturing processes, whatever your job is, to do it over a prolonged period of time and to do it right. You know, right now, when we go up into space, we only have a week or two at a time. So what we find is that we have to press very hard. We have to sprint to the finish line. Uh, and you have to sometimes forego uh, an experiment that you just discovered in, on orbit would be a good thing to do because of the intermediate results that you've gotten. But you don't have time to do that. So on Space Station, we'll be able to do that interactive science. And I think it's going to be very important and very rewarding. Colonel, uh, what are you conscious? What what speed are you traveling at once you're in your, your uh, orbit? Seventeen thousand five hundred miles per hour, and if you work it out, that's five miles every second. Now, are you conscious of that you, uh, speed? You really are. Even though we were up at a fairly high altitude, we were up at about a hundred and eighty miles above the Earth, circular orbit. So we stayed at about a hundred uh, eighty miles altitude above the Earth. You could just pick out things on the ground that you knew, like a large runway that was a couple of miles long. And you could see how long it took, or how short a period of time it took for that thing to move out of your field of view. And that be, it made it aware to you. Or you could see the whole city of Baton Rouge or New Orleans go by in just a flash. It made you aware of just how fast you're going. Uh, 
How does the earth look? Does it look like a round ball? Yeah, I'll never forget my first look out the window. Once again, as we were going up into orbit, I snuck a couple of peeks out the window, but really I was devoted to watching the instruments that I was responsible for. But shortly after main engine cutoff, after we were on orbit, I had the opportunity for the first time to just look out the window. And it's breathtaking. There's no film, no camera, no picture that can capture this. It's an immense Earth. It's mainly blue and white because those are the colors that you see when you look down on the Earth. And that's contrasted by the absolute darkest black you've ever seen. Even in daytime, the sky is black uh, up in space. And in between these two, you have this very thin, hazy region of atmosphere. And, and you realize just how thin that atmosphere is and how important it is to us, to the people here on Earth. Colonel, uh, all right, so you're prepared. You, you, you give us a picture of training that is just superb. On your flight, did anything happen unexpected or that you were not quite ready for? Not quite ready for? <coughs> as far as uh, training to physically fly and to be a pilot of a space shuttle, I can tell you that there was nothing really that cropped up that said, man, I wish they had told me this before I launched. And one of the reasons for that is that after every crew gets through with their space flight, they come back to the astronaut office in Houston, and we all gather in the conference room, and they tell us everything uh, that happened to their flight that surprised them. So for the last four years, I've been hearing people talk about their space flights. So uh, you add up the training we get from, uh, and the advice that we got from previous astronauts that have flown, and there's really nothing that totally surprised me. So no warning bells, the entire flight went off in you, and you said, uh-oh. No, no. We the did light have, went on yeah, and off? Yeah, we did have several warning bells, uh, several lights that went off. But you do, once again, what you did in training. You go to the uh, computer screens, you call up the pro appropriate screen, quickly figure out what the problem is. And most of the time, it was either a problem with an instrument that had malfunctioned and was telling us that something was wrong when it really wasn't. A couple of times a fan or a compressor pump had died and we had to switch to the alternate pump nothing or the alternate scary. fan. Nothing Nothing earth shattering, no. And I think it says a lot for NASA and for the space shuttle program that we're able to go up for two weeks with the world's most complicated flying vehicle and just have very minute problems. Colonel, uh, okay, so you're ready to come down. Now your job is really, you're going to take... Is that a great sensation to know you're finally going to run this big thing? Yeah, it really is. You know, as a pilot, certainly it would be fair to say that my most important jobs occurred during the ascent up into orbit and then coming back to Earth. In the middle time, I'm a jack of all trades. I, I'm a laboratory assistant. I'm the main cook and bottle washer. I keep the uh, vehicle healthy, uh, doing any kind of maintenance procedures that are required. But certainly coming back to Earth was a big thrill. We actually turned the vehicle around backwards and uh, fire two maneuvering system engines for about two minutes, slow down a couple of hundred miles per hour, not very much compared to our total speed. That slows us down just enough so that we actually fall down into the upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, once we do that, uh, the upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere cause enough friction that causes us to slow down even more. And the, uh, the thing that really got my attention, because our simulators don't really show us this in Houston, is that uh, you're literally sitting in a fireball because you, as you fall into the Earth's upper atmosphere, as you slam into those air molecules, it heats them up to about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, about 10 times hotter than your oven at home probably when you cook. And uh, the windows are covered by an ionization cloud, if you will. It's heated air molecules surrounding you. You can look over your head and see the plasma trail as it goes away from you. As a matter of fact, I've been told by several people here in Baton Rouge and Alexandria and also in New Orleans that because we flew right over the state of Louisiana on our way back to the Kennedy Space Center, and it was in darkness at about 5.15 a.m. on the morning of July 23rd, they were able to look up and see the wow. fireball across the sky. And that's neat because at the same time, I was able to look out my window and see Alexandria and Baton Rouge and New Orleans go by. Colonel, quick question, because we've only got a few minutes. Tell uh, uh, our audience and your fellow Louisianians, your next mission? Well, my next flight, I've just been assigned to STS-74, which means the 74th shuttle mission. And I'm really excited about it. It's going to be an entirely different kind of a flight. We're going to take off and rendezvous with the Russian space station, the Mir space station that's already up there right now. Uh, we're going to be taking up some supplies, some water, for example, and food. But most importantly, we're going to be taking up a large piece of hardware, a docking module, and we're going to attach it to the Russian space station. And then when we back away and leave, we're going to leave that piece of hardware behind. 
and it's really the first step toward this process of building the International Space Station uh, that we'll be doing for the next five to ten and years. And you'll go to Russia to uh, uh, work with their... That's right. As a matter of fact, when I leave here tonight and go back to Houston, I have some Russian homework. I'm having to learn the Russian language right now, and I have a class tomorrow morning. So uh, one of my tasks will be to learn Russian so that when I go over to Russia, uh, probably in February, I'll be able to communicate with these people, and they'll be able to teach me about their space station. Are we ahead of them? I, it's not a fair question, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we do some things better. Technologically, I believe that we are superior. Our computers are better. Our high technology efforts are better than theirs. But you know what they do that we could learn a lesson from? They build things solid and simple, really? and they last. Really? And they suffer fewer malfunctions because they go the simple, rugged route, whereas we go the more technologically elegant Isn't that route, which sometimes suffers more failure. So I think there's some interchange and some learning that we can do from them. Colonel, I know how very proud Don and Jean Halsall are of their son who flew with his daddy years ago in Monroe, Louisiana. And the reason I know how proud they are is because I think that uh, they uh, could speak for every citizen of this state. Uh, you're about as good as we're capable of producing. And uh, I know that uh, I speak for the four and a half million people of this state to tell you how very proud we are that uh, uh, someone like you comes out of us, comes out of this state, and uh, conquers the heavens. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. It's been our pleasure. And we hope to see you later at the Louisiana Legends Banquet in May. I hope to be able to make it there. Thank, Thank you, you for the Colonel. invite. Good. All right. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years.